Is it possible that the story is the primary living organism, not the storyteller? Mm. So that somehow humans, uh, Homo sapiens evolved to become th these like hosts for a more intelligent living organism, which is the idea. And the ideas are the ones that are doing the competing. So this is one of the sort of big perspectives behind your work that's really revolutionary of how you've seen history. But do you ever kind of uh, take a, the perspective of the ideas as the organisms uh, versus the humans? It's, it's an interesting idea. I, I, there are two opposite things to say about it. On the one hand, yes, absolutely. If you look long-term in history, it's all, all the people die. It's the stories that compete and survive and spread. Mm -hmm. And stories often spread by making people willing to sacrifice sometimes their lives mm -hmm. for the story. Um, you know, we now in, in Israel, this is one of the most important story factories <laughs> in, in human history. Yeah. And this is a place where people still kill each other every day over mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I've, you've been to Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. So. People say, ah, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You go there. I've lived in Jerusalem much of my life. You go there. It's an ordinary place. You know, it's a town. You have buildings. You have stones. You have trees. You have dogs and cats and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. It's a regular place. But then you have the stories about the place. Oh, this is the place where God revealed himself. This is the place where Jesus was. This is the place where Muhammad was. And it's the stories that people fight over. Nobody is fighting over the stones. People are fighting about the stories about the stones. Mm -hmm. And the stories, if, if, if a story can get millions of people to fight for it, um, it not only survives, it spreads, it can take over the world. The other side of the coin is that the stories are, uh, are not really alive because they don't feel anything. This goes back to the question of consciousness, which I think is the most important thing. That the ultimate reality is consciousness, is the ability to feel things. Mm -hmm. If you want to know whether the hero of some story is real or not, you need to ask, can it suffer? Um, stories don't feel anything. Uh, countries, which are also stories, nations, don't suffer. If a nation loses a war, it doesn't suffer. The soldiers suffer, the civilians suffer, animals can suffer. You have an army with horses and whatever, and the horses get wounded, the horses suffer. The nation can't suffer. It's just an, it's just a, an imagination. It's just a fictional story in our mind. It doesn't feel anything. Similarly, when a bank goes bankrupt, uh, or, or a company goes bankrupt, or when a, 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 a currency, loses its value, like Bitcoin is worth now zero, crashed, or the dollar is worth zero, it crashed. The dollar doesn't feel anything. It's the people holding the dollars who might be now very miserable. So we have this complex situation when history is largely driven by stories, but stories are not the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality is, is feeling, feelings, of humans, of animals. And the tragedy of history is that very, very often we get it, we get the order wrong. Stories are not bad. Stories are tools. They are good when we use them in order to alleviate suffering. But very often we forget it. We, instead of using the stories for our purposes, we allow the stories to use us for their purposes. And then you start entire wars because of a story. You inflict millions, uh, suffering on millions of people just for the sake of a story. And that's the tragedy of, of human history. So the fundamental property of life of a living organism is the capacity to feel and uh, the ultimate feeling is suffering. You know, to know if you're happy or not, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> yeah. But when you suffer, you know. Yes. And also in, in, in ethical terms, it's more important to be aware of sufferings than of any other emotion. If you're doing something which is causing all kinds of, emo uh, all kinds of, of emotions to all kinds of people, first of all, you need to notice if you're causing a lot of suffering to someone. 
If some people are like it and some people are bored by it and some people are a bit angry in you and some people are suffering because of what you do, you first of all have to know, oh, now sometimes you still have to do it. You know, the world is a complicated place. I don't know, you have an epidemic, uh, governments decide to have all those social isolation regulations or whatever. So in certain cases, yes, you need to do it, even though it can cause tremendous suffering, but you need to be very aware of the cost and to be very, very, you have to ask yourself again and again and again, is it worth it? Is it still worth it? And uh, the interesting question there, implied in your statements is that suffering is a pretty good component of a Turing test for consciousness. This is the most important thing to ask about AI. Can it suffer? Because if, if AI can suffer, then it is an ethical subject mm -hmm. and it needs protection, it needs rights, just like humans and animals. 